Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Sober Yoga Girl podcast. I am so excited to be sitting here with Dupe Witherick. And Dupe is the author of Cocktail of Clarity, and she is a coach, um, a sobriety coach. She used to work in the corporate world. She uh, is starting to run retreats for women and does workshops for um corporate uh, organizations in the UK. And I'm so excited to have you on the show and hear more about your your sober story. So welcome, Dupe. How are you? Thank you, Alex. It's so lovely to be here. I'm really well. I'm really well. Yeah. And I'm thrilled to be on this podcast. So thanks for having me. Amazing. So happy to have you here. We were just chatting before and I I really thought I had had you on my show. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's because I've been on your show a couple mm-hmm. times. Um, mm-hmm. but yeah, I feel like I I know you and I'm connected with you. And um, so I'm really excited to have you on the show officially, to actually have you on the show and to hear your story. Yay. <laughs> so I was wondering if you could just kind of give us a little bit of context on like what was your life before your sober journey and how long have you been sober for? Yeah, so it'd be four years on the 9th of November, so in a month's time, um, four years alcohol-free, and it's crazy when you th- when you think of it. So I only I was only going to take a 21-day break, and it's now four years. So a lot's happened in those four years, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, but it's interesting for someone who might be listening, thinking I need to stop forever. You know, if I stop, I need to stop forever, or, you know, I can only stop for X amount of time. Um no, you don't have to put pressure on yourself and take a break and see what happens. And you never know what could what could change in life. So yeah, I just wanted to highlight that. Amazing. Yeah, that's incredible. So what was your life before going alcohol free? Like what was the buildup like to to that choice? Hmm. Yeah, I I tend to you know, it's funny because I don't have like a rock bottom story or a road to Damascus story. It was none of that. It was very much I would have considered myself a normal drinker. and Life was pretty good. I was, you know, pretty successful in the corporate world. I have a lovely family. You know, I've been married for many, many years now. And we've got a daughter who's 10 and, you know, had a good life, went on nice holidays, did a lot of business travel. I've worked across the globe. Um, I've been fortunate enough to, to work pretty much on every continent. Um, and I, you know, we enjoyed life and we used to throw lovely dinner parties and, you know, have lots of fun. And it was just normal. So we would drink, you know, I would drink what I would class to be a regular amount depending you know but I suppose it's based on who you surround yourself with so if I go back I initially started drinking properly probably when I was about 18 years old and went to university and that to me when I think about it is probably where a lot of my beliefs around alcohol started to form because it was like a rite of passage drinking was a rite of passage you get to university you're sort of away from home and you know a lot of the things that you do are all around you know to to do we have freshers week here I don't know what you have in Canada or or in the US or wherever people are but We have something called Freshers Week, which is the first week, and you're getting to know people and you're joining clubs and joining various things to create a network. And that was all around drinking. And so that just seemed to be the thing to do. And I remember being in our hall of residence, which is where where we stayed in that first year before you all moved out into houses around the place. Um, And in that hall of residence, there were about 180 of us and only two people didn't drink. In my mind, only two people. That's what I remember. And those two girls that didn't drink were ostracized. No one wanted to talk to them. They were boring. They didn't go out. They didn't have any friends. <laughs> and so for me, alcohol, drinking was fitting in. Drinking was having friends. Drinking was being able to socialize and have confidence. Drinking were, was so many things. And then I moved into the city of London, into the corporate world. And again, you'd have your, you know, team socials, you would do networking and conferencing. You know, I was a management consultant for many years, which involved a lot of working with clients all over the world. And so 
a lot of business travel. So you jump on a flight and they thrust you a glass of champagne and, you know, and, and it just felt like it was part and parcel of what you did. It was just never questioned. Um, and so it became more of a habit, I think. And that habit then, um, when I was in my late twenties, unfortunately, my my brother passed away, and uh, he was very young from an illness. It was unexpected, and he was my younger brother, and I was the eldest. So I was see, trying to look after my parents and my other brother, and and it was a tough time. And so then I think I found myself using alcohol to numb the pain and to sort of not feel <laughs> as it were um and keep going and so it became more of a habit at home which ha it hadn't been it wasn't something it was something I'd do when I was out and about and then it started becoming a bit of a well I'll have a drink at home instead of when I go out and then it got to and then in my early in my sort of well I was 30 nearly 34 when I had our daughter and so when that happened you then I then got into sort of the mummy wine culture and it's the deserving wine because you're a mummy <laughs> which is ridiculous when you look back at it but it's the only way you can cope with parenting and so I think throughout the 20 odd years that I was drinking it had just become something that was never questioned and then towards my late 30s I'd always loved really heavy red wines. I'd lived in Spain for a year. I, you know, do vineyards and just love the sort of full bodied red wine and realized that actually I couldn't drink those red wines anymore. So I'd have a glass and it would just not make me fit. My body would like reject it. And so I thought, well, I never thought, oh, don't drink, stop drinking. Didn't listen to that. That wasn't even a question. My thought was, I'll go on to the lighter red wines, so the less, you know, le with less alcohol, and um, tried those. And again, after a while, I think my body was again rejected. Now, what I didn't see, what these were signs probably saying to me, maybe you want to take a break or just not drink or whatever. But again, just didn't really think about it. I tried those to do dry Januarys because it was the cool thing to do. But I, yeah, I would inevitably get to about a week and then say, well, it's the weekend, so I just won't drink on during the week. I'll drink on the weekend. And then by the time you get to Monday, you're like, well, I've failed. So what's the point? I'm not going to bother. Um, so you, so that had been probably, you know, off and on doing those sort of challenges, dry January, Lent. Um, I don't know if sober October existed then. Um, and then I thought, well, I can't drink these, these lighter red wines. So I'll go on to the white wines. It all sounds, when I'm talking about this, it sounds ridiculous because obviously my body was saying, this isn't good for you, this isn't something you need, but at, at no point did I think I'm going to stop drinking. So then I, in March 2020, I was fortunate enough before the, well, it was, the, the COVID was around, but I managed to climb Mount Kilimanjaro and did that for charity which was the most amazing experience it was six days on a mountain um well six nights on a mountain and it was epic it was just one of those experiences where you think this is amazing I didn't drink anything of course because you're on this mountain climbing not that I thought about that at the time but what I do remember is that as soon as I came down and got back to the hotel the first thing I wanted was a glass of champagne to celebrate that we'd achieved this thing but while on that mountain I'm convinced that that was the start of me being where I am today because I had this real sense that there was more that life could be so much more that I was capable of so much more I hadn't done anything like that in my life and it was just it, it, the amount of resilience it took to do that was a lot, but I also really enjoyed it. I felt myself being really present. I took lots of photos. I was learning Swahili. I was talking to all the guides and the porters. I was trying to keep everyone upbeat. I just remember it being a really amazing experience for me. And what I didn't appreciate was actually I had kept, a, this was only in hindsight, I'd kept a lot of people going. And I remember having a bit of a down day. I think it was about the Wednesday. We were about halfway through. And 
I woke up and everything seemed to go wrong and I spilled water in my bag and I felt down and I felt like, oh my goodness, can I actually do this? And the, the lead guide said to me, you're the one that's keeping us all going. You, we need to see your smile. We need to see you sort of upbeat. You're, you're sort of helping everybody. The people are seeing you as the person to sort of help drive this. And, um, and I had a couple of hours just to myself walking on my own with my headphones in. And I got out of that sort of mood and then it was all brilliant. But someone said to me, because I shared all these photos with the group, there were about 30, 30, 35 of us doing it afterwards. And I remember a lady coming back to me saying, thank you so much for taking all these photos and sharing them. Because when I was doing this, I don't remember seeing any of these things. All I was doing was focusing on the feet of the guide in front of me. I didn't look up. I didn't find my, I just needed to get through it. And I had such a different experience. And I also thought when you get, you know, I remember thinking at the top of the mountain, there is definitely more. I'm made to do more. I need to make more of an impact. I need to help people. There was something that I didn't know what it was going to be. I didn't know what I was going to do, but I had this real strong sense. And you can call that divine intervention. You can call it you know, whatever you believe in. But for me, it was like this real strong sense that something was whispering that you can do a bit more with your life. So anyway, I climbed a mountain, came down and the world changed because we then were in COVID a week later in the UK. We were locked down, didn't really get a chance to acknowledge what I'd done, to celebrate it, to really share it with family and friends. It was just like, right, we're now at home. (laughs) And and so then we went into sort of survival mode, didn't we? I think everyone, no one knew what was going on and we were homeschooling and we were trying to, I was trying to work as well. And I remember probably working harder while we were at home than I had before. I was on Zoom calls all the time. I was, you know, it wasn't really looking after myself and it got to about, and I was the people of purpose lead for my team, my sort of immediate team. And so I was telling everyone in the team to go for walks and to not be on their screen all the time and to, you know, to to do some exercise and look after themselves. I was all about well-being, and (laughs) but I wasn't doing any of it myself. And it got to about October and I thought I can't, I felt like I was burning out. I felt like I wasn't really looking after myself because at the end of the day, in order to sort of break that, you know, differentiate work from home, even though we're all at home, I'd have a glass of wine because that was our, okay, I can relax now. That's the differentiation. And so it got to October and I had this real strong sense that taking a break from alcohol could be a helpful thing for me. Where it came from again, I don't know, but our church, the church I was going to at the time said, let's do something for 21 days, give something up. And I had a real strong sense it was alcohol. And on the 9th of November, So on the 8th of November, that was the last drink that I had in 2020. And um, funny, funny story. I opened a bottle of champagne because I was only drinking champagne and gin and tonic at that point, which is ridiculous. But I opened a bottle of champagne knowing I wasn't going to drink a bottle. It was such a waste of waste. But I opened this bottle, (laughs) poured a glass, had as a last hurrah before my 21 days off, had a sip of that champagne. And it I felt awful. Just having that sip, it made my stomach churn. It made me think this isn't this isn't something I want to do anymore. But I'll stop for twenty one days and and then probably go back, but just not not really drink very much. And I took that I, and I took that as a sign because I was like, okay, right, my body is rejecting alcohol now. <laughs> it's not it's not liking it. And um, and I, ironically, I hadn't drunk for a few days before that. So why I felt the need to even bother I could have just carried on um but it again it was a habit it was a sense of ritual it was a sense of reward and so I thought I'd do that um and then yeah so the 9th of November I just said that's it I will stop for 21 days and in those 21 days a few things happened which then made me think okay let's keep going and and now here we are sort of four years later that's incredible. Congratulations. Thank and you. in that initial sobriety, like were you part of any sober program or like what were your supports to to get through that? 
Yeah, so not at the beginning, no. I didn't even know anything about sort of the, the sober community. Um, I was literally, I remember going to bed early, reading and just drinking lots of tea and coffee and water. <laughs> that was it. I didn't know anything about alcohol-free drinks. All I knew, there was one that was called Seed Lip at the time, which was popular, but everyone had said it's disgusting, so I didn't even think about having that. Um, and yeah, I didn't know anything. And then as, and prior to when I stopped, that just before I stopped, I remember getting a sense, that inner knowing sense um, that this was a good idea. But I also heard the truth will set you free. And I didn't, again, know what that meant. I was like, free from what? I've got, you know, I said, good life, friends, family, lifestyle, all good. Um, but what I've realised since is it's actually, it's nothing to do with the external. It's all about the internal. And so it's how I've changed internally and that sort of sense of peace and calm and joy that I feel and I think that's due to not drinking um and so during that time I stumbled across a couple of TED talks and one of them was Jolene Park's grey area drinking never even heard the concept for me again you only stop drinking if you hit rock bottom or if you were teetotal for religious reasons or whatever, but you wouldn't choose to stop drinking. Why would you choose to stop drinking? I also realized that all these celebrities that I thought drank didn't drink. I then um, I then stumbled across a podcast and started listening to that. And then I did join a community probably about five or six days before. And so I went onto this Zoom and I remember listening to these people who were saying, oh, my goodness, I'm three months in, I'm six months in. Oh, I've experienced this pink cloud. Oh, my goodness, I'm doing all these things. I love it. I won't go back. I'm not going. And I was listening, thinking, what the hell? You're choosing not to drink. There's nothing wrong, but you're choosing not to drink. You've actually made that decision that you're never you're you're, you're not drinking for now. Um, and then there were other people who'd been on, you know, alcohol free for a year or two years and. And I just couldn't get I couldn't quite comprehend it. It didn't make any sense to me. And so I was adamant. I was on. I remember speaking to them and saying, I'm not I'm only not drinking for 21 days and I'm going back to it. And they were like, oh, right. OK. And the thought of not drinking over Christmas and New Year just wasn't, <laughs> wasn't going to happen. And so they were lovely. And we by the end of it, they somehow said to, to me or made me think I'm going to take I'm going to do at least a month so I'll go from 21 days to a month and then it ended up I ended up doing this juicing challenge and and learning about you know the impacts of alcohol and everything else and just thinking well actually maybe I'll do a bit longer and then I had and then I and I'd also in that month 21 days which was really spooky actually and again made me think maybe I'm on track here for something was I read an article about uh, an alcohol-free fizz. And as I said, I was drinking fizz and gin and tonics. And so that was my, my thing. And the person who wrote this article was like a top wine critic who basically said this is the best alcohol-free drink that they have ha ever tasted. And there weren't many around at the time four years ago. It's such a different world now. But I read it and I thought, this seems really familiar. I feel like I've seen this before. And I was like, well, how, why do I feel like I've seen this before? And then I remembered I had a bottle in my cupboard. And so rewind a bit, because why would I have a bottle of it in my cupboard when, you know, what the hell? So that summer, someone had come over for, for lunch or dinner and brought this bottle with them. And I looked at it and said, what the hell? Why, you know, I was obviously polite. But to my husband, I was like, why the hell do they bring this? Especially when they proceeded to drink my wine. I was like, no, no, no. You <laughs> <laughs> something alcohol free. And so I stuffed it in the cupboard and I forgot about it. This must have been in the August time. And so I suddenly had this thought. I think I've seen this before. Went into my cupboard at the back of my cupboard. It was like it was waiting for me. And I tried it and it was amazing. And we were, it was a girl's night and everyone thought I was drinking normal champagne or fizz. And, and it wasn't, I didn't say anything. And I realized actually, if you can drink something that tastes quite good, 
that makes you feel good in the morning that also makes you feel like you're enjoying yourself why the hell would you go back and so my Chris my first Christmas involved basically having lots of alternatives to what I would normally do and I had the best time I felt like a child I was excited as my, our six-year-old daughter Christmas day opening all the presents and seeing her face and just the laughter and the genuine laughter was just amazing that really you know I felt like my eyes were opened and so other things happened throughout that initial period which then made me think let's keep going and yeah and here we are wow that's amazing that's uh it's so inspiring and I love that perception shift that you talk about because I definitely used to feel that too around like you know why would I like, why would I drink something that's that that's alcohol free and like the the symbolism of that bottle, like literally being yeah. in your cupboard <laughs> and, um, and then the the reframe of thinking you had around that. That's just amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me about writing your book. What prompted you to write your book? Did you plan on doing that or like how did that come about? Yeah. So one of the things I did do quite early on was I journaled a lot so every day I was writing something and I had obviously I wasn't doing it to write a book but actually it a lot of it ended up feeding into the book and in um 2022 April 2022 the end of April my day before my birthday in fact I ended up I was probably the fittest I was. I'd been running. I hadn't run since school. I started running. I started doing yoga in 2021. And um, I did my first half marathon in, in the April 2022. Um, and I felt really fit. And I was, you know, I was on a real high. But the day before my birthday, on 29th of April, I ended up going to doctors because I wasn't feeling very good. And I'd had a week of not feeling great and various symptoms that I was a bit worried about so I went to see them and then they sent me to hospital like they said you need to go to hospital straight away she looked quite uneasy um so I was sent to hospital I had to have all these tests midnight came I was still in the hospital and I was like it's my birthday <laughs> and I was surrounded by strangers <laughs> and they all wished me a happy birthday but it was like the most surreal thing because when you feel like you're really healthy and then you've got something um and so anyway I was diagnosed with something um that potentially was going to be chronic and I was really poorly for the first for about five months I was in and out of hospital getting my blood taken every week and it was it wasn't a nice I was on steroids and lots of medication and um yeah I wasn't in a good wasn't very good um but in that time uh I had this I wasn't sleeping well and um, I was reading, I was reading and I was like two in the morning, I'd still be awake and I'd just be reading and trying to keep calm and not stress. And uh, I was still able to do things like yoga, which was a godsend because it meant I had something that I could move my body and try and breathe and, and do all of that. That was really helpful. So again, having all the tools that I'd learned from not being alcohol, from being alcohol free was, was helpful during that period. But there was one, one night probably two, three in the morning where I had this download, <laughs> you could say, of Thrive Alcohol Free and all the things I was going to do with it, which included writing a book and starting a podcast and being, you know, coaching lots of women and speaking on stages. And this was like all downloaded to me. And so that's where the book came from. And I think it was that sense of if you're unwell or if life was going to, you know, it wasn't that dramatic, you know, I wasn't near death or anything, but if life was over in the next few years, what would you want to have done? What would you like to leave behind? And I think that's why I thought I need to do more than what I'm doing. I need to impact people. I need to help people. I need to inspire and make a contribution to this world and so the book was on the list again I wasn't sure how I was going to do any of this I wasn't really in the right frame of mind to do any of it um, but then I ended up writing the book later that year and early the following year and it came out in April 2023 
a year after, pretty much a year after that diagnosis that I had. And I, I was absolutely, the doctors couldn't believe the turnarounds. And as I said, it was meant to be a chronic illness, but there was no sign of it. Those five months later, it had completely gone back to normal. So, um, so very grateful and blessed to to not have to be injecting myself every day and doing various things that would have been awful um, because of this illness. So, uh, so yeah, that long, long answer to your story, but that's that's where the book originally yeah. came from. That's so that's so incredible. Do you think working on the book like supported you in that recovery? um in like in that recovery process from that illness diagnosis I think a lot of things that I'd learned from being alcohol free around well-being self-care um just looking yeah looking after yourself and actually things like breath work and meditation and, and those things yoga um and then running as well I could run a little bit um at the beginning, I had to be really careful, but then I was able to run and things. And just having those tools that I promote as part of your alcohol free toolkit with my clients that I coach, they're all just life tools. They're not, it's not about the just the, the ditching drinking is is obviously a big thing. And I, it's not an easy thing for some people and other people it's easier. But it can feel like a massive, massive thing at the time when you first take that break and stop drinking but a few months in I always say if you can get to sort of 90 days 100 days you start seeing things change and you start you've you started to learn how to um incorporate other things habits healthier habits and rituals and passions and hobbies and self-care and, and all that good stuff which you wouldn't have done and I wasn't certainly probably wasn't doing um you know as I said on the mountain I definitely found a passion that I didn't know existed uh and then doing you know training for that as well before doing lots of walks in the countryside they were all things but I was still drinking at the time but again that was sort of these are things that I do now I do a lot of walking I do a lot of running and being in nature is really important to me but I think having those tools and actually doing them help me I I and obviously you know I believe in God as well so I'm sure you know I'm convinced he you know he was part of it but I think it was just yeah if I had if I'd still been drinking I don't know whether the diagnosis would have been worse I don't because they thought it was something else that was more serious originally which is why my doctor was really concerned um so all of those things I'm sure that because I wasn't drinking yeah. it helped me recover quick more quickly and then also helped me helped it not to be a chronic illness yeah. that's incredible you know it's incredible and I hear so many stories like this of um people just having like health um turnarounds in their sober journey like I'll mm-hmm. share one example my uncle who was my first guest on the, on the podcast, um, many years ago, he's now like six years sober. And, um, before sobriety, he was on like a ton of medication and he had certain things like sleep apnea, like he struggled with sleeping. And then when he got sober, he went off like every prescription he was on just because he started, like he stopped drinking, he started walking and that was it really. He just started walking and he didn't do anything drastic, was not going to the gym, um, or anything. And, uh, and you hear so many stories of this, of like people's health literally turning around because of mm. their sobriety and the life tools. And I just think it's so mm. inspiring. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, no, I'm very grateful. So I, you know, part of the community that I joined, I did a course, um, and it was all about, you know, the well-being aspects, the nutrition, it was more holistic sobriety. And so that's then that then inspired me. On my journey to to become a coach to help others and to to create courses etc and write the book and start the podcast so, so yeah amazing okay I want to ask you about your pod or not your podcast uh your retreat 
So you're coming to Bali next year, next June. Um, you're finding Freedom Retreat for Thriving Women. So tell me about that. Yeah, so I'm really excited about it. It's a seven night retreat. Um, and I really think it's all about transformation. So for me, thriving alcohol free is about freedom, which is why it's finding freedom. But it's also about self development, personal growth. And this is going to be a real combination of transformation, well being, nourishment, being in the amazing Balinese culture with that you know, the beautiful people there and just really thriving in a community of like-minded women. So it's a, an intimate, exclusive retreat, but there'll be 12 of us and we're going to be doing a number of excursions. But on top of that, we'll be doing daily yoga. And then I'm also going to be doing daily coaching sessions. And through the coaching, it's really going on a journey to first to find what does thriving alcohol free mean to you. But throughout the week, we'll cover various things that will help you think about purpose, think about how to manage and process emotions, how to really make alcohol insignificant if it's still not quite insignificant to you. And then what are your goals? What's your, how to embody your alcohol free identity fully and what is your vision for the next six to 12 months so that you can get home and really feel like you've 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 had that self-care well-being piece but you've also transformed as a person and you're ready to step into fully step into your power of being alcohol free and thriving so it's going to be an amazing experience we've got some fantastic things that we're doing throughout the week We'll have things like sound healing, breath work. We're going to be going to a waterfall. We'll be um, doing some Balinese cooking and marla bead making and then doing things like water ceremonies and fire healing ceremonies and, and other things to really go on that spiritual rejuvenation journey. And I can't wait. And so um, and hoping that you Alex are going to join us one of the days and we'll do something special there we'll do a little surprise so I uh, yeah I think it's going to be amazing and for me it's about the community it's about having an instant connection with people as well so if you if you join us you will have an instant community of, of friends really who are all like-minded who are all on the journey together and it's for anyone who is already alcohol free and you could have you could be alcohol free for as many years um but then also people who are maybe just starting the journey and would like a real boost so and, and really step into that alcohol free identity and thrive and not feel deprived so if it's something you're interested in then yeah i'd love people to get in touch Beautiful. Amazing. And we can put the link to that in the, the show notes. So if anyone is listening and Thank interested, um, it just you. sounds amazing. And, and I'm super excited for you. you. I know you'll have a huge impact on the women who, who sign up and join. Yay. Yeah, I can't wait. I can't wait. And I know the right people will be there and it's going to be life changing. So um, yeah, I'm really, really excited about it. Beautiful. Oh, amazing. Okay. I have one last question for you, which is, um, if you had any advice or any wisdom for someone who's just starting out their sober journey, their alcohol-free journey, what would you say? Yeah. So I think there are probably three things. One, know why you're doing it what's the reason and write it down somewhere and so that when you have those days where you think i'm going to reach for a drink then you can go back to it and say actually no this is why i'm doing it what is the reason for stopping drinking for x days or for x months or whatever it is you you say you want to do the next thing i'd say is make it a non-negotiable it's really easy to say you're going to do something and then actually be swayed by people by your friends by your family by people that sort of say go on have one um and as well if you your partner is still drinking you may think 
you might may think, well, how am I actually going to do this if they're still drinking? And you, you might start learning things and then want to get them to stop and they might not want to. And so just know that this is for you. This is something you're doing for you and make it non-negotiable. And then the third thing I would say is look at it as something you are gaining. You're not giving anything up. So reframe it in your mind and think about what is it that you, what are the benefits that you're seeing and actually journal. I think journaling is really helpful. And each day you don't have to journal for, for hours and hours or anything, but just ask yourself, how am I feeling today? What has happened today that may not have happened if I was drinking that is positive? And what am I grateful for? Maybe write three things that you're grateful for. And then look back at that. When you get to a, a week, look back at what you've written and you'll see how you've changed over that week and what's happened. And, and hopefully you'll start seeing some changes. And that will also change the way you think about alcohol as well and you'll see that by not drinking you're actually gaining and not giving anything up wow i love that that's such an inspiring note to to finish on thank, thank you. you so much dupe this was an amazing episode and it was so wonderful to hear your story and you're such an inspiring speaker like right when right when the interview started i was like oh yeah i've definitely never had dupe on the show before because <laughs> I like this. It was just incredible. And so I just oh, want to thank you so much for your time. And uh, you. I'm going to put the links in the show notes for anyone that's curious about getting involved with Dupay's community or reading her book or joining her Bali retreat. And uh, yeah, I hope to connect with you again soon. Oh, I appreciate this so much, Alex. Thank you so much for having me on. And um, yeah, take care and I'll see you soon. I'll see you in Bali in June. Amazing.